We are now joined by Matt Turner, who's the author of a remarkable new book about Texas plants. They are the remarkable plants of Texas, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the name of the book. And Matt, welcome to Central Texas Gardener. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Now this is a, a, a plants person's book, but with a twist. Um, you know, we were talking about the books that exist on the market, about how you learn about native plants of Texas a little while ago, and there's a, kind of, there was a kind of a deficiency that you noted that you were hungry to fill. Right, um, I would look at various books that would help you decide what a plant was and give you its name and where it grows and whatnot, and then it would just stop. And I would always want to know something a little interesting, more human, a tidbit about the plant. Does it have a, only grow near water? Does it have the longest roots? Is it the strongest wood? Uh, do people make tea from it? And, and this little extra bit that would connect me to it as a person, as a human, mm -hmm. uh, was usually missing, because usually right. there wasn't space for it. And I just thought, well, that's a shame. Yeah, <laughs> well, and, and, but you have answered that uh, in this new book. Right, I decided that, well, I'll just write the book then. Mm -hmm. And um, I really, they're really more stories than they are, um, I didn't set out to write a book about uses, though mm -hmm. I'd say 80% of it is man's uses of plants. Mm -hmm. But it really are just uh, stories. Wherever they led me, I followed them. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes that's ecological, sometimes it's historical, sometimes it's m myth and folklore, sometimes mm -hmm. it's medicine. And wherever the plant kind of took me, I followed. And I was just amazed at how much stuff there was, you know, just sitting on an ordinary plant that grows at all of our feet, and we all know, all right. Central Texas gardeners know, and yet, did we know these interesting facts about it? Yeah, and that's what's so fun about the book now. You have botany in your roots, so to speak. Yes, my, <laughs> my father is a famous uh, a retired professor of botany at UT, mm -hmm. and so I grew up around it. Uh, sometimes at the dinner table, I would have to name the uh, families of every plant I ate. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually pretty good. <laughs> Very good. Well, let's start off by talking about some of these plants. Sure. Because there, there are a lot of really cool anecdotes about these things. And I love this, the section on oh, well, the, all the information about how these are used. Uh, Texas Mount Laurel is a plant that uh, most Central Texas gardeners are familiar with. It's the grape soda plant of spring. Um, tell us a little bit about what you learned about uh, mountain laurel that uh, we can uh, see in the book. Sure, well those bright red beans, which I'm sure everyone who's been around one knows of those beautiful mm -hmm. red beans, mm -hmm. um, have a fascinating history. I mean they go back 10,000 years in Texas history. There are sites in West Texas where these are found in archaeological sites in great number. And no one quite knows why uh, mm -hmm. ancient people were using them. There's a lot of speculation. Um, the, the predominant theory is they were used for uh, shamanistic purposes, hallucinogens and whatnot, but there are actually no hallucinogens in the seeds that we know of. It's just really poisonous, mm -hmm. but poison, if used in a ritual context where you're expecting to see visions and things, uh, would make people think it's a hallucinogen. Mm -hmm. And a lot of historic Indians, the Caddo, the Comanche, the Tonkawa, the Kiowa, uh, the Wichita mm -hmm. um, use the seeds for either purging or um, so as mm -hmm. make you throw up or or uh, as a again something to make you see visions um, and so people worked backwards and thought well that must be what ancient man was using them for too mm -hmm. but I mean uh, Cabeza de Vaca, who landed on our shores to shipwrecked in 1528, right. um, he was held uh, as a slave for a couple of years. He finally escaped and became sort of a shaman healer, and he traded extensively in these, these uh, seeds. Interesting. And in fact, the, the other th theory is that they were just used for decoration. They're bright, red, gorgeous mm -hmm. beads. And or children play with them, too. Right. And so the, there's, and I've heard of stories of uh, during the Depression where uh, children would use them for marbles. Yes, <laughs> yes. And there's a hot bean game where you rub it and burn your neighbor's uh, arm with it. <laughs> <laughs> but actually they were traded as far as Montana, the Blackfeet Indians, wow. um, attached to leggings and bandoliers and stuff. And uh, So just, just as a simple export, Texan export, it, w it made its way all the way to Montana. Okay, so the next time you uh, stop to smell the grape soda, think about uh, the different uses in the long history in association with mankind of Texas mountain laurel. Another plant that you talk about in the book is the little chili piquin or chilpatin. Right. 
That is a great pepper, and uh, it's a great plant to grow in your garden. It mm -hmm. loves part shade, and yeah. most of us in shady Austin are yeah. trying to find plants that will work yeah. there. Uh, that is actually the mother pepper of almost all peppers that wow. we eat today. Mm -hmm. Anaheim, Bell, Cayenne, mm -hmm. Poblano, Serrano, that is the mother pepper of all those, mm -hmm. um, DNA evidence suggests. Mm -hmm. And it's been found uh, back to 9,000 years ago, um, the wild peppers have been found in Mexico mm -hmm. that uh, and therefore basically the first documented human use of a spice anywhere in the world. Wow. So um, that's an amazing little tidbit, yeah. I think. Just <laughs> For a plant that's growing in the cracks in the concrete. Right, because <laughs> I think we tend to think of it as just, oh, it's just a little, you know, uh, scrappy pepper, when in mm -hmm. fact it really is the mother pepper. Mm -hmm. And it's very hot, and it's wonderful. You can save them and dry them and use them. And They're murderously hot. Yes, <laughs> but they dissipate quickly, which mm -hmm. the, in Spanish it's called arrebatado, which means mm -hmm. um, it dissipates quickly. So yeah. it is the preferred chili for menudo. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that, but See, it makes sense. There you go. It also <laughs> is the state native pepper of Texas. Okay. The state pepper is jalapeno, but the state native pepper is the chili piquín or the uh -huh. chili pepín. Well, they're they're beautiful little plants too. I mean, yes. Just bright, bright colors. Very exuberant right. color. It's just terrific. Uh, let's talk about another one. This, the horsetail, the equisetum. Right. And I've heard some uh, talk about how this was used during like pioneer days, but this is a plant I always associate with wet s uh, soils right. and a rampant grower. Yes, it's a great erosion control plant. In mm -hmm. fact, there is a story of a, a gentleman uh, in Bandera County who had a stream bed that was eroding and he planted uh, just one plant and within three years that it was 100 square yards that it had taken over. Oh my goodness. It's a greater, it has vast under, underground roots that mm -hmm. hold the uh, soil in place. Mm -hmm. um, amazing thing about this plant, it is a living fossil. If any genus of plants deserves um, that moniker, it is a horsetail. They go back 350 million years. That's before the continent split mm -hmm. up, that's before dinosaurs, that's before the mass extinctions. 350 million. It's ancient. And, and at those time, their ancestors were 60 foot tall trees. Mm -hmm. And they would look very similar to the horsetail that you know from ponds. Uh, Tree size. <laughs> right, with bases two feet across. It's one of the only known plant that requires silicon to grow. Mm -hmm. And in fact, little silicon tubercles form on its surface, which are scratchy. And that's why it's called scouring rush. And mm -hmm. it can, Many people the world over have used it as a polishing agent mm -hmm. and sort of as a sandpaper substitute. And it's very good for that purpose. I see it used in a lot now of modern gardens who want very simple uh, shapes in the geometry of this plant, this little pencil-like right. growth. Right. It's perfect for that. Yes, I think in a lot of modern gardens it's being used more and more because yeah. it's just kind of cool. It is a cool plant right. and uh, interesting history. I can, and again, thinking of a tree size one makes it all that much more interesting. Right. Yeah. And dragonflies are ancient too and one lands on one I always think, and they love perching on those mm -hmm. and I always think of, wow, it's just like time stopped and you're getting a little vision back That's to 350 million years ago. One of my favorite plants, uh, uh, I spent some time in East Texas and I, th I always think that the big thicket got its name because of Yopon Holly. Because you know the, the yopon gets so thick there, you need a machete to get through the woods. But uh, there's a lot of lore associated with yopon as well, right? Well, the fascinating thing about yopon, and this seems to be very hidden from just common knowledge, is it is a fantastic tea. It is a great native tea. It's one of the only plants in Texas that contains caffeine. 0.27% caffeine in the dried leaves. And um, yopon grows all the way to Virginia right. and North Carolina. And every Indian tribe between here and there drank a tea from it, mm -hmm. a naturally caffeinated tea. And uh, all the early pioneers, all the Spanish, every explorer that came into this region drank the tea too. Mary Austin Holly, the uh, cousin to Stephen F. Holly, mm -hmm. talks about how it was a common, tree of a common tea and a very good one. Mm -hmm. And what fascinates me is it just vanished. I mean, no one seems to know this. We, mm -hmm. we, we kind of know you can make tea out of horse mint, but no right. one talks about yopon. And uh, it's close, the parallel story, which I love to tell with this, is yerba mate, mm -hmm. same genus, right. growing in South America, right. also used by the Indians. All the colonials come in and drink that. It becomes a national drink mm -hmm. of, uh, of Argentina. Right, what? well, and there also the opon was used as a purgative as well, the berries, right? Oh, no, actually the, the tea was too, but oh. it's, not, it's not the tea that's making you purge. Yeah. It's drinking three to six gallons of pipe, <laughs> piping hot tea on an empty stomach. Oh. And that's why it gets the unfortunate name of vomitoria. <laughs> yeah, well, that is a little unfortunate for a botanical name, but we, we have to wrap it up there. But I, I do want to recommend the book to our audience at home. Uh, this is, if you enjoy these stories, that's what the book is about, connecting human stories 
to the plants, and I think you'll find it fascinating. Uh, Matt Turner, thank you very much for being our guest on Central Texas Gardener. And again, the book is Remarkable Plants of Texas on UT Press, correct? That's right, that's right. All right, thanks so much for being our guest. And coming up next, it's our friend Skip Richter. <laughs>